Hello, hello, this is Steve D of the YYT and it's time for the third of my set reviews for Opus 21. Exciting times. I get the lightning element this time around and honestly, I couldn't be happier. I think lightning ended Opus 20 the best it has looked since at least Opus 5. Probably before then, arguably ever. Lightning actually had exciting multiple decks that could be played and I think that has only been bolstered by this Opus. I'm really, really pleased, broadly speaking, at how everything is looking. So let's dive into the cards and we're kicking things off with a legend. Uh, you know a man is good for you when he's got a ponytail, a cowboy hat and a butterfly on his finger. When Irvin enters the field or attacks, so I'm thinking Alba so far. Choose up to two cards in your opponent's break zone. I'm still thinking Alba. Remove them from the game. If two characters are removed by this effect, until the end of the turn, Irvin gets 2,000 power, haste, and first strike. Hating on your opponent's break zone, however passively, is very powerful. Just about every deck that is remotely worth playing in the Opus 20 format was using, utilising the break zone. Nothing plays off the top of the deck anymore. It's all about recursive loops. Even decks like Storm that are fairly combo-centric, a lot of the time you'll be recurring a Luzo that you discarded on turn one for CP, things like that. Irvin is very powerful at just passively keeping on top of your opponent's break zone and beating down face. I don't think he necessarily goes everywhere. I think that if you're playing some kind of a control deck or some kind of combo, deck you won't necessarily want him but any sort of aggro tempo mid-range he is very above average for what he does i think that 2000 or you know two, plus 2000 power to be 9000 power and first strike basically reads unblockable and at the same time your opponent's break zone is being shredded so your opponent has to deal with him if they want to keep their investments in any way protected and on top of that he's got a pretty cool special I don't think he's a card name that there is any reward or any reason to overload on. We don't have many good Irvings in print, but uh, I think this one is fine, and Lightning's in a decent place to recur copies to hand with uh, whatever kind of Chadley effect you want, if you really want to use that special. There's no denying as well that uh, Forward or Monster of cost 5 or less, that's like any monster in play. There are, there are no relevant monsters outside of that. Basically every monster that sees play is like cost three or less. So it kills any monster remotely relevant to the metagame and a huge swathe of forwards as well. So I think there's a lot of decks that will really enjoy this guy. I could see Earth Lightning playing him as a way to get some cards removed from the game and shore up X death counter, things like that. He's uh, just a super powerful, very simple card that you can stick in a deck at any number of copies and probably cause some level of improvement. Uh, some would call that boring card design. I think it just makes a really good card and it's rather pretty to look at as a full art as well. Kind of cool. Moving onwards, we've got a Red Mage. This is, uh, yeah, Red Mage playing tennis with a Pokeball there. So Red Mage uh, is part of a cycle of backups. You gain a Crystal on entry and if it's your third backup or less, you also draw a card. So promotes early ramp, gives you a little bit of dig and stuff like that. I'm not convinced there's many things in Lightning that are worth playing Crystals for. You know, unless it's like Earth Lightning and you're playing Crystals, but I don't know if this is like breakable enough or cyclable enough as a backup. So, uh, kind of remains to be seen. But uh, there's no denying that like backups that draw cards give you a little bit of dig are fundamentally quite good. So, rather pleased with how this looks on the whole, and it's definitely an absolute housing sealed. Up next we've got Ace, who's uh, just become aware of the fact that he's got a name bar above his head and he's looking up at it. When Ace enters the field or attacks, usually a good sign, get some value right away, get some value every turn. If you control two or more Class 0 Cadet, trivially easy to do, draw a card. So that's okay, Like you, you can basically read him as a 2CP8K that's also going to deliver you some value over time. And you can discard one card, any card at all, no sort of criteria behind it, to choose one forward and dull it. Ace gains 1,000 power till the end of the turn. I really like this. Uh, it's kind of unfortunate. It's a big problem behind cadets in general is that every card ever is called Ace. Ah, please make it stop. But this is uh, honestly really good. I think this outclasses a lot of the Aces. It keeps the cards flowing, especially if you want to play three color cadets. That's really important. Um, although it doesn't kill something every turn like the Opus 9 Ace pretends it's going to. I think that uh, it's very good at pushing for lethal because you can just cash in your hand for dulls. You can dull things during your opponent's turn to stop them getting attacks. Very, very flexible, actually. Super flexible action ability. It's a shame that all the Type Zeros have got this kind of, a, you know, ugly picnic blanket cloth background because uh, uh, I think that, they, honestly, sometimes they deserve better than that. And, uh, and this is one of those cadets that I think a lot of the time is going to farm you cards. And the fact that he can bump himself from 8k to 9k fairly cheaply means that he's not always going to be the easiest to get off the field either. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that this guy could see some competitive play 
Uh, it just means that there needs to be some other cadets playable. And uh, there's been a lot of forwards printed this set, not a lot of backups. The backup game has not changed significantly for cadets, but I'll probably give it a go because it's one of these fan archetypes that everyone wants to see. And speaking of fan archetypes everyone wants to see, if there's anything you would like to see or any decks you would like built for the Opus 21 season, stick them in any of the comments below and I would be honoured to give it a try. If I think it's any good, I'll even publish the list. Odin, wow, look at that tortured face. That guy has seen some stuff. Uh, as is fitting of basically every Amano card ever, it is sleeve considerable. Uh, actually, I think this card is really, really good. Choose a forward or a monster of cost four or less. So already, it's literally just miles better than the Opus 1 four cost Odin because it costs three and because it's got more flexibility in what it can choose. And like what I said about Irving's special, monster of cost four or less might as well just be any monster in the game. There, are, There is nothing relevant really outside of that. Break it. If you control five or more lightning characters, also draw a card. I genuinely think this is insane. I think it's one of the most amazing mono payloads I've, I've seen. Very exciting summon, very exciting time to be playing any kind of slow setup oriented deck. And uh, it's just going to be nuts off Man in Black, the Opus 17 Man in Black. Really like this card, really strongly rate it. Very flexible and good for your tempo too. That draw a card, it's just like Brunhilder. If Brunhilder was a terrifying man with a yellow face and a shield and sword, it's uh, scary. Emperor Gestal on the other end of the scale, kind of cute and cuddly. So Emperor Gestal being in Lightning, at first I was like, oh, that's a shame, a Category 6 card that's not Fire or Ice or Water. But uh, yeah, I think it's fine. You don't view this as a Category 6 card. I don't think there's a relevant way to play this as a Category 6 kind of card. It's just quite a good card on its own. When EG enters the field, you may discard a card. When you do so, choose a forward in your break zone, add it back to your hand. So it's either a two-cost backup, or it's a kind of a four-cost Kusith type effect, which is fine, you know. It's uh, very powerful in sealed to be able to do that and recur your big bummy legend or whatever. And then for 1 CP, tap it, sack it, choose four cards in your opponent's break zone, remove them from the game. If those cards are of the same card type, that is summon forward monster backup, not, you know, what element they are, then you also get to draw a card. So he's break zone hate, he's kind of like a little mini mist dragon, very powerful to hold that open during your opponent's turn, and he gives you a little bit of flexibility when you play him as well. I quite like the card, I'm sure somewhere it will see some play, rather interesting, but it's very difficult to imagine this being more than a one-off wherever just because it's a named backup. Gunbreaker, edgy. When Gunbreaker attacks, do 2k to your opponent's board. When Gunbreaker attacks, you may also pay a crystal if you want to, to do a separate instance of 2k to your opponent's board. Absolutely fine, probably really quite powerful in sealed or draft or something like that. I do think this set will draft very well pre-release, eh, not so sure, but uh, certainly drafting. Try and get a box and draft it with your friends or something and, uh, you know, keep what you draft. I don't know. Set aside a few packs for... Uh, for prizes? I don't know. Uh, yeah, Gunbreaker. I'm, I'm more interested in the draft than I am in the Gunbreaker, put it that way. Machinist. Screw the little Lalafell in the foreground. I want to know more about that robot in the background. That is the most exciting thing I've ever seen. When Machinist enters the field, choose one damaged forward to do it 5,000 damage. Put a hat on your opponent's hat. Action ability as well that says choose one forward and do it 2,000 damage. So I guess in multiples you can go first one, ping one of your opponent's guys, then play another one, shoot something. It's okay. It's it's sealed fodder. I, I don't think uh, even in a sort of damage-oriented deck or ping or something, I don't even think this is strong enough to see play in Popper really, but but for sealed, it's fine. It's something that your opponent's going to have to watch out for, for facilitating perhaps multiple trades upwards in value. Gilgamesh, another cute common. When Gilgamesh is put from the field to the brick zone, gain a crystal. Okay. Uh, for one crystal, until the end of the turn, Gilgamesh gets haste and brave and can attack twice in the same turn. There's a lot of Gilgamesh can do that. This one's pretty decent. That's sort of all I've got to say. Damage 3, 4 CP, 9k. He's totally okay. Maybe all of those uh, red mage crystals that we amassed on our backups, you can vomit into Gilgamesh or something. I just don't see this being constructed playable, but most commons and rares are not designed to be. It's more of a happy accident when they are. They're there to balance sealed gameplay, and you shouldn't judge them too harshly next to things like, I don't know, Amaterasu. Queen. Uh, okay, deep YYT lore here. My nickname in the YYT chat was changed because of this card. Yeah, um, I, I, I think the artwork is really cute, you know, and uh, you know, you, you point that out once and suddenly people think you've got a noseless Voldemort fetish. Queen, uh, 7k, haste, 3 CP, and importantly, it's a name that nobody cares about. Every other queen printed so far has been absolute total trash. There has never been a good queen, even with respect to the way back then. All of the queens suck. Uh, this queen, really good. Uh, if queen is attacking, this is really confusing actually. She's got loads of text, 
while attacking. Outside of the combat step, she's just a 3 CP 7k haste, but there's so much text here that your opponent might want to kill her before you get to combat, before you get to the attack declaration stage. If queen is attacking, queen gains. If queen is dealt damage, the damage becomes zero instead. So while she's attacking, your opponent can't block, really, or they're just going to end up taking the, you know, they don't get to damage queen back with combat damage. And also, queen cannot be chosen by your opponent's summons or abilities while she's attacking. Confusing, right? Uh, it means you're going to have to kill her before combat or forever hold your peace. I guess that means that it's kind of safe to pump her up with buffs or things like that mid-combat and not worry about being tricked out of it. Also for two lightning CP, uh, which is convenient, you know, one discard from hand. Queen gains 2000 power till the end of the turn. You can only use this ability if you control two or more class zero cadet. So maybe a cute little combo with ace. I think these guys are absolutely going to destroy a sealed environment. And one of the best archetypes you could be drafting, or opening if you're lucky enough, is uh, a bunch of these cadets. So I do think queen is quite interesting because she's an aggro tool that's actually quite hard to answer. Or makes your opponent play in a very telegraphed way that stops you getting like two for one or something like that. So she's totally okay. I do think the artwork is a bit of a high point, but if I point it out too much, I'll get an even worse nickname. Cloud, here we go. Uh, one of the many cards that are from Category Woff. It's amazing that this Cloud is not from Category 7. What are those Category 7 collectors with their shiny binder going to do? Do they ignore it? Do they not? Do they care? If you control a card name Lan or a card name Rain, the cost required to cast Cloud can be paid with CP of any element. That's a very long-winded way of saying you can play him in Fire Ice Woff, you can play him in Fire Earth Woff if you're one of those Opus 10 retro Puritans. When Cloud enters the field, you choose a forward your opponent controls. If its cost is less than or equal to up to the number of Woff characters you control, break it. I really like this. Even using the Opus 10 retro example, like, it's not too hard to have a couple of WAF backups, and you've probably got a rain on the field, and then you go play Cloud, kill your 4-drop, attack with a couple of guys, kill something else. It's very easy for this guy to facilitate maybe a straight 2-for-1, maybe even a 3-for-1 in the right deck, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm quite a fan in general. Um, it helps, I suppose, that there's a really good rain and a really good land in Lightning, but they're looking for a sort of a monster deck. It's a little bit further away. I'm not sure yet where the best home for Woff is going to be. There's enough stuff in Lightning and Fire and Ice and Earth that I'll be taking a look at each of those. But uh, yeah, apart from that, who knows? Excuse me, water break time. That's going to sound really weird to anyone who's, uh, who's not watching. Black Knight, okay, glowing red eyes on the horse and the man. You wonder if they're connected? Maybe it's like a giant statue with a burning coal inside it or something. When Black Knight enters the field, you choose one forward or monster of cost two or less your opponent controls and break it. So this is like a monster equivalent of, what's it called? Ramu from Opus 4. One cost Ramu, choose one EX burst, break a forward of cost two or less, break a monster of two or less. This is completely telegraphed, you have to play it at character speed, but it does get to sit there on the field. That means a few things. It counts towards your character count, which is more relevant than ever with cards like that Odin hovering around. And also it's got an action ability, pay 5 CP, two of which must be lightning, put Black Knight into the break zone, choose one forward or monster of any cost and break it. <clears throat> I don't mind it. I think it's quite a cool looking full art. There's something to be said for that. I think it is just a little bit below sleeve playable. Because it's not a forward, because it never actively impacts your board state or board presence or something, I kind of wish it could kill things up to cost three. I think that was a fair trade for the Ramu being able to be, you know, an instant and an EX burst and stuff like that, and it costs less. Uh, I, I think I was maybe looking for a little bit more from this Black Knight, or a little bit more range or something, so you could trade positively on CP. But, uh, yeah, I don't know, um... It makes your opponent think twice about committing to exactly lethal if Black Knight could be there to undo their plans and they can never be too uh, ambitious when they're like flickering stuff with Renoa. I don't know. I'm making this up. I want to believe in Black Knight because I love Category 2. I like the full art. I like the glowing red eyes of the horse. I don't know. Man in Black. I would love this card if it wasn't for the fact that the Man in Black in Opus 17 is one of the best continuous value cards in the game. I think that the other Man in Black being able to loop summons, being able to give extra text to all of your summons, is really huge. He has sort of uh, economy, but also implication attached to the other Man in Black. And this guy just affects implication, not your economy. <clears throat> So you can't play Man in Black or Golbez while in control of either character. That doesn't matter, there's never been a good Golbez. Uh, at the beginning of the attack phase during each player's turn, choose up to two forwards that your opponent controls. If your opponent doesn't pay three, those forwards cannot attack or block. 
uh, I want to believe in this. I think that preventing two points of damage per turn is quite huge. I think that preventing two blocks per turn is less huge, but still sometimes huge. And making your opponent pay that three is pretty good. You know, it's, it's, it's very quickly going to become easier for your opponent to pour everything they've got into killing Man in Black than it is in paying three turn after turn after turn, or accepting that they never get to deal damage. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, there's that throat I was talking about. Uh, so, uh, damage 5, mana black gets plus 2,000 power. When he's a 10k, he's, uh, he's a lot harder to get off the field, I suppose. But, uh, yeah, he's very good and he's going to be very annoying in a sealed environment. But I think the other man in black, it's just unfortunate that he's got one of the, the, the toughest names for a lightning card to have. It's one of the most immutable, awesome lightning cards ever printed, is the other man in black. And, uh, yeah, you know what? I'll try it, probably, see how annoying the 3 cost gets to be. But uh, I'm not too sure. <clears throat> not too sure about this guy. Zande. Wow, I love this card. Absolutely adore this card. I think it's exceptionally, exceptionally powerful. And follows on exactly from what Mono Lightning was trying to do in the previous set. Uh, 5 CP 9k. Okay, kind of fine. Sounds a little bit Opus 2 so far. When Zande enters the field, choose one forward your opponent controls. If you control four or more Lightning characters upon this ability's resolution, break it. If you're against aggro, it's not out with the realm's possibility of going three backups, you know, three backups by the end of turn two, and then you've got Zandi Life to help you stabilize on turn three onwards, which is kind of the critical turn for aggro decks. Uh, when Zandi enters the field, additionally, choose a forward in your break zone. Any forward, any element, any cost, any job, anything at all. If you control eight or more lightning characters, play it onto the field. I mentioned before... Mono Lightning was in a really good position at the end of Opus 20. There were tons of ways to play it. Generally, kind of tempo to mid-range. It was a cool place to stick the Scions of the Seventh Dawn. Most of them happened to be Lightning, most of the good ones anyway. And even things like Fire Alpha Node you could search for and cheat into play a couple of different ways in Elements. So it's really easy to make a wide board. On top of that, there's a not inconsiderable number of Lightning monsters. And it's really easy to ramp backups in Lightning. They've got tons of exciting utility backups with EXs like Set of Clan Gully or that dude who cares about multi-elements and stuff like that. We've got quite a few different backup engines if you're into Turks and all that number of different things. Uh, I'm really keen on ramping to five backups, using the Lightning EX burst or whatever to stabilize, uh, play down a couple of monsters to make the count a little bit easier and also harder to interrupt, and then Zand, kill a forward and resurrect something else, which could be an LSA, which gets me blah, 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 on and on and on. I think this card is absolutely insane. I don't get it, but people were playing Idea last set, Opus 2 Idea. And it was just because we'd got things like Weaver and we'd got, you know, an actual reason to be playing mono decks again. And um, it's like Fire gets Opus 13 Rain, a card who can kill, you know, a 10k and uh, he gets to cause 1 CP and then change the field every turn thereafter. And Mono Water gets Ash. Idea does not stand up to those cards because she costs 6. 6! Six! 6 CP! That's that's ugly, you know? Um, I think that the Idea slots can just go straight out of most decks and you can stick in Zand and you will barely notice a difference. But also Zand rewards a little bit cleverer deck building just to reach that 8 character count a tiny bit easier. And then cards that you see in the early game and discard for CP like Phil Thanos, you know, sometimes Phil Thanos absolutely solves games, Zand can cheat him back onto the field. You can resurrect 11 CP Dark Chaos if you're so inclined. I know that uh, Mono Lightning and Earth Lightning are pretty common places to play the, the Chaos Arc combo as well because you've got access to Man in Black and that's a pretty hard checkmate. I genuinely think Zan is very powerful. If you're on the fence, play him, see what it's like. If you really don't like him, I implore you play him. He is phenomenally powerful. I did a bit of testing with him so far and I've never been so happy to play Mono Lightning. Even the good old days of Opus 2 with Al said Onion Knight feeling like the coolest thing you could do. This is better with respect to Opus 21 than Al said was with respect to Opus 2. Shantoto, I had a dream. And trust me, my dream is more interesting than what this card does. I had a dream that they printed a 3CP Lightning Shantoto backup with an EX that said search for any black mage. This card does not do that. Moving on. Uh, uh, when Shantoto enters the field, choose a forward, do it 3000 damage for each different element among characters you control. The rainbow decks don't really want to play lightning. Like the good four color decks, they have no interest in playing lightning cards. There's no payoff for it. You know, four color warrior of light is not a lightning card. That's it. Trey, okay, uh, yep, he dipped his hand in soy sauce or something there. 3 CP EX backup, choose a job class zero cadet in your break zone, add it to your hand. Trey is a cadet name that nobody cared about. It was a very old card that's been rather power crept from Opus 3 or something. 
So having Trey, an actual lightning backup, I'm pretty sure this is the first ever lightning backup that is a cadet. That's honestly astonishing. So uh, yeah, I mean, ignore the fact he's got a special, it's all right, but it might not come up especially often, but it's an EX person that gets you cards and he gives you pseudo CP fixing if you want to play like a three color deck. This card is what cadet players have been asking for for a very long time. They just might not know it yet. So it's really good. <clears throat> Nine, okay. Uh, I nine is one of those cards that I feel like we got this legend nine back in Opus thirteen, and it promises you the world. It does something on entry. It does something on attack. It's got an alternative casting cost. All of these cool things, and uh, there just wasn't enough lightning cadets to be remotely playable. No lightning backups. Not enough lightning forwards. All the queens in print sucked. And uh, we've waited so long and so long for that situation to improve that I honestly think that that nine from Opus thirteen. It's confusing to say, huh? I, I just don't think it's that good anymore. Not not by current standards, you know, killing one forward on entry, one forward on attack for 6 CP or costing you two dulls that turn. It's just not enough anymore. So uh, the fact that this is called 9 does not put me off too much. If 9 is dealt damage, reduce it by 2,000 instead. So it's an absolute headache for some elements to kill. For 0 CP, choose a forward and dull it. Again, either player's turn. Like the ace before, it's very easy for your opponent's blockers, would-be blockers, to just not exist. And also, it's quite easy for you to prevent one, maybe more, points of damage per turn just by saying, nine doesn't like your guy, dull it. So, uh, yeah, I, I think they've, they've done quite a good job of printing some decent cadets here. And uh, it's rather nice that uh, they're in lightning for a change and they're not all called ace. It'd be really weird if they were all called ace. Nelika looks very cute. FFBE artwork is always absolutely on point. It is always just like absolutely phenomenal. Really, really good. Uh, slightly futuristic and fantastical. She is a job. Blah, 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 blah. That's pretty cool. Uh, if you control two or more category FFBE characters, she gains haste. That's okay. FFBE has enough characters that you can probably do that if you're sufficiently inclined. When she attacks, choose a forward your opponent control, dull it, and do it 3,000 damage. Oh my god, Sid Rain's support. It's only been 20 sets and they've finally printed Sid Rain's support. Uh, too little, too late, I'm afraid. <coughs> Dying again, my apologies. Uh, yeah, she's another aggressive card then, I guess. You know, like, she can, she can have haste, and she can dull something as she attacks, and maybe ping, maybe the ping damage will matter, maybe it won't, but access to dull is pretty cool. And I think that if you want to play anything aggressive in Lightning, she's quite a considerable character. You just need some other way of playing an FFBE card in there, but uh, it does count your backups, so you've got things like Echo, the wind backup that could search for her, and then you've got this reasonable pressure tool. Shame she's only ever 5k, no inbuilt protection or something, but uh, I don't think that's really the things that are going through an aggro player's mind. Palom. The pose says, I've been standing still watching you eat cookies from the cookie jar for the last 45 seconds, but the hair says, I've just fallen from a four-story window, so I'm not really sure. Uh, 4 CP forward, when Palom enters the field, you choose a forward of cost three or less, do it 9,000 damage. Watch out, because if your only targets are on your side of the field, you do have to shoot your own forwards. The EX person is nice, I suppose, because then it's optional. I think this is just a very fair card for sealed. I'm struggling to... I don't think any Palom Porom deck is going to care about this. It is another black mage, though. It's a forward black mage, so if you want to play black mages, you know, if you want to play black waltzes, this is a, a pretty credible card. Yeah, quite like it. I mean, we did have the fire Palom backup, but that doesn't really give an awful lot of relevance other than being a static, uninterruptible black mage so that your VVs can do more each turn. Maybe you'd prefer the forwards. And, uh, you know, three more EX bursts instead. So the fact this is a black mage is kind of cool. Uh, I expect it will actually see some play on the back of being a black mage. Category four, doubt it. Firion. We're on to the last two cards of Lightning now. Uh, Firion is really, really cool. Uh, I like 1CP cards. I like 1CP cards because there's a lot of support for them, like stilt skin and like zombie, you know, practically every element. There is something. This Firion does not need to be in mono Lightning, but it certainly could be. And basically, like, 1CP is such a small investment the a 1CP card doesn't need an awful lot of text to have an awful lot of impact. And this Ferion has tons of impact at the right turn of the game. If your opponent controls four or more dull characters, that could be backups that they've used, or forwards that they've attacked with, or that you have dulled, whatever, Ferion gets 5,000 power and brave and can attack twice in the same turn. See, Gilgamesh, this is how you're meant to do it. This is how you do two attacks a turn. 
When Firion or a forward enters your field, choose one character your opponent controls and dull it. This is actually really interesting to me because there will be times your opponent will be sitting with a certain number of backups open, trying to respond or thinking about responding with a particular thing, and then you go, I'll play a lightning card, force you to dull one of your backups. Now you have to use your response, or maybe it'll be inefficient to do so after this point. So uh, I think it's quite interesting that you can force your opponent's backups to dull, like character dulling is rather unusual. There's lots of dull and freeze or freeze your opponent's backups, not so for uh, for just dulling backup. So it's, it's, it's kind of odd that we've now got this niche. But of course, like peanut aggro and uh, bonking your opponent over the head is kind of the main place this card's going to be useful. Being a one cost, you could play it in Bart's Boko and then it'll have haste and brave and a bunch of stuff if your opponent's got enough dull characters. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure this is a competitive enough card in the right kind of place. And then the last of the lightning cards is a Dragoon. Oh my god, it's a Dragoon. Yeah, I was really hoping this would be like another Sky Dragoon or Sky Samurai or something from the artwork, but I think this is honestly a very, very good card. It's almost good enough outside of the Dragoon synergy, but uh, whatever. When Dragoon enters the field, choose an active forward, do it 8,000 damage. If you control four or more backups, do it 8,000 damage instead. People who played Dragoons as an aggro deck are doing it wrong. The most exciting thing Dragoons can do is set up a bunch of backups so that you've got an uninterruptible Freya special, and also the fact you've got Alice as well, who just draws you a bunch of cards. Uh, like, Dragoons is best played as a sort of a fast mid-range deck, and Dragoon exactly fits what that's trying to do. It is a card that you play, and it says bye-bye to one of your opponent's cards. Just staying that one card ahead, a good top deck that can kill something on practically any board, is exactly what Medrage wants. If you are a Dragoons player, you will want three of these in foil right now. Incredibly exciting. I figured I should check the next card to make sure that was the end of the Lightning. Uh, as always, or as I feel like I'm saying a lot this set, the Legends are really, really good. I think Zend is absolutely incredible. I actually really quite like the Cadet stuff. Um, let me see, is there anything else? Oh, Queen. Oh, we all know I like Queen. Uh, yeah, Odin I think is absolutely cracked as well, so very good set for Lightning. I'm very keen to make some uh, choice investments of some Lightning cards this set. So please let me know your favourites or anything you are looking for uh, deck-wise, and I'll, I'll see what I can do when the set finally drops. Thank you very much for watching. This has been Steve D of the YYT. Bye-bye.